All right, good morning, everybody. Mike Courtney here, Mass Mutual Eastern Pennsylvania Brokerage Director. And once a week, me and my good friend, Steve Parisi from IBC Global get together to talk about all things life insurance and uh, business process and marketing ideas. And today we've got something um, very specific. I've got a problem that um, I asked Steve to to uh, help me out with. Um, and Steve is prepped for the call. And this is something we've talked about a little bit before, but just over the last couple of weeks. Well, Steve, first of all, good morning. How are you? Oh, fantastic, my friend. Thank you. How about you? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> good. Um, so Steve, over the last couple of weeks, and you know, you know, this, this goes on all the time, but I've had a couple of different financial advisors come to me with either IUL illustrations that they're looking for me to compete with, or uh, just in general, kind of louding the, um, you, you know, the benefits of a, of a well-designed IUL policy. Uh, I've got very strong feelings about this for a variety of reasons. I feel like my responses in these situations start to sound adversarial, you know, I think that there's a lot of problems with IUL. We can get into that, but um, you know, I definitely have an agenda where I'm looking for folks to sell whole life, and I'm promoting. Um, you know, I promote insurance solutions, but I am leading with Mass Mutual every single day. So, I mean, I'm a Mass Mutual wholesaler. So, you know, my conversations with these financial advisors sometimes start to sound a little adversarial. They start to sound like uh, I'm trying to win an argument. And a lot of times I feel like I do win the argument and I lose the business. Mm -hmm. So didn't really win the argument, you know? <laughs> so what's, you know, just kind of generally, how, if, you're, if you start working with a new broker who wants to work with your agency, or if you're working with a client who's already been shown some numbers, how do you talk through the, IUL versus whole life conversation uh, in general? Yeah, good question, because it does come up quite a bit. Um, so the first thing I'll do is often ask the question, hey, from your research thus far and looking at IUL, whole life, have you just looked at IUL or have you compared both? Kind of what are your thoughts? Um, so I'll, I'll start just with that question to get a, a sense of exactly where they're at in their research. Um, and typically newer brokers or even some experienced brokers and agents will say, when I look at the numbers, or I, let me rephrase, when I look at the illustrations, the IULs just produce so much more value over time. Like I feel like I'm doing what's in the client's best interest because they've got so much more money and they want to use this for retirement. Is that sim similar to what you'll run into there? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, yeah. you know, we use illustrations um, to highlight the product and to explain how the product works and to sell, you yeah. know? So I find myself in a position where I'm like, you know, if you're just looking at the illustration, you know, these illustrations are a story. It's not, you know, this isn't like factual or guaranteed what's going to happen. Um, but so, so is the mass mutual illustration. C correct. Correct. All, all illustrations when you look at it. Um, thank you for that. So I'll always start with that question to get a feel for where they are at, how knowledgeable they are. And if they're just looking at the illustration or if they go a bit deeper, um, cause you never know until you have to ask someone the question. Um, then I'm not going to go through every question I'll ask, but what I'll get into and this is true with IUL, it's also true with whole life, is the biggest item of buyer's remorse where people have regret with cash value life insurance products, whether it's whole life or IUL, is often when they are sold a policy, they're looking at the illustration, their advisor or agent is saying, hey, look at this 30-year cash value, this 20-year cash value, whenever, here's the value that you'll have. And it might differ a little bit if dividends go up and down, if it's an IUL, if the performance varies in the S&P 500 or whatever index it's linked to, but you should have something close to that. 
when those words are spoken, which I would say about 90% of agents, I shouldn't say that, but 90% of agents I've encountered when I've seen them engage with, with uh, potential clients will typically state that, that I came up in that on that side of the business. Um, leading a client to believe, hey, this is what you should have because the agent is told that by their superiors and such. When that happens, the client, the consumer feels, hey, this looks good. I mean, this illustration is projecting the greatest amount of value. Yeah, I'll go with it. And then this is the problem with cash value life insurance and where advisors who are anti-cash value life insurance have a field day. When that product under delivers, because it often does, sometimes drastically, and I think I'm going to have a million, and then I have 400,000 or less than I paid in, that's an issue. Or if I've done one, or two, one to two percent, and then I say, hey, cash value life insurance stinks, I post articles online, and that's where this battle comes up. Um, so that was a lot I just gave you there, but it's really just over-promising and under-delivering. But the thing is, it's not the agent's fault because they don't often know. They're encouraged to push it, sell it. But when you look at actual data, and we can get into this point as well, and we can go deep if you want. When you look at actual data with IULs, I have never seen a policy. I've seen hypothetical illustrations, but never seen an actual policy that has delivered an internal rate of return north of 4%. Not the annual IRR, what it's earning over year over year, but the average over a long duration of time. And we've got studies, yeah, and there's a million of them, not a million of them, but several. We've got them on our YouTube channel channel of policies issued from 2008, um, issued in 2008 through 2020, the end of it, the study period. That should deliver strong results, and I haven't seen it. I guess Where did you get that, that information came from those respective carriers? <clears throat> so where I got that information, actually, the two case studies we have, one was from a client um, who provided his annual statements. So we were able to go back and track year over year what the policy actually did and then looked at the illustration, what it projected, and then what it actually did. The other one was from an agent who had sold IUL for a long time and he kept on seeing the policies under deliver. Clients would come back to him all ticked off saying like, hey, what's going on here with my money? Like, I thought I was going to have everything you told me I was going to have. And the agent's like, uh, the, the illustration, I was told it would and you're in that position that no one wants to be in. Um, but... Just to answer your question, the agent sent me the original illustration and the annual statements and said, hey, I designed this thing for low commission, high cash value for the consumer, and it didn't deliver. Like, I don't know what I should do now. It was 12 or 13 years old, um, the policy that is, but it was just, it was a net IRR of 2% were projected at that point in time about 5.5% and annually 9% 9 and change. But it was under delivering his thing. And without getting too deep into that, right. expectations were set. You'll have a lot of money. Reality was you don't have a lot of money. It's too late now. That's where people get upset. Um, I talked a lot there. There's more I can add, but any questions or comments on that? <laughs> yeah, did you? I know. I mean, I kind of, I, I almost know the complete answer to this question, but not fully. So I know that you go back to, when you talk about the big four yeah. um, mutual companies, Mass Mutual, New York Life, Guardian, Northwestern, you've spent a lot of time and the folks in your office have spent a lot of time um, finding real policy performance. Right. And I think you've been able to quantify that for all four of those Correct. companies. Right. So meaning that all four of those companies have either disclosed to you, or you've been able to find real policies where you can see historical funding, historical performance, internal rates of return on cash value, et cetera, dividend performance. Have you made that same kind of attempt with some of the real strong IUL players Good question. So the the hard data we have is from clients and agents. Um, one of them like is those from, kind of scenarios you were just talking about. Yeah, not not to the same same extent because we haven't been able to get the data. Um, we've asked every carrier, all of the major players that offer IULs, and some of the policies we have those historical studies. They're not 
that deep in terms of history. They're issued in 2008, but they're from larger, well-known carriers that issue IUL today. I don't want to mention them because they, they weren't that attractive, the, the IRR, but um, not as extensive as what I have done with Whole Life to answer your question because we haven't gotten the data there. Um, that's why, but you know, yeah, yeah. Let me leave it there, and then I'll continue on. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the data should be a little more forthcoming. From you know, just the fact that it's that hard, um, and it same same goes for the for the mutuals. I mean, I know you put a significant amount of time and energy and, and manpower yeah. into compiling all that data, right? Yeah, and you know, when you look at the the major mutuals and whole life in general too, like because we have we have carriers that frequently come to us saying, hey, here's a product, will you offer it? And I'll always have a conversation. And where that conversation typically ends is I'll, I'll ask, hey, do you have any historical performance policies that have lived the test of time, really with an internal rate of return north of 4%, the average, not the annual, <laughs> the average right, IRR. Right. Um, and that's where it stops. Like the answer is yes, let me see if I can get it. And then then I, I don't get it. Never. Um, correct. So I have gotten that from the major mutuals consistently. We've got our own policies that we've placed. I've got older ones that other brokers have placed. And it's just clear evidence. Like when I look at those major mutuals, I've seen policies deliver internal rates of return 4% or greater, regardless of what the illustration projected. I don't, I don't really care about that. Like I know they deliver when they're set up properly and everything. And going back to that key objection that people have with cash value life insurance and what I know competitors, financial advisors are going to tell potential clients we work with, don't do whole life because it's horrible. I want to make sure that when someone set up, someone we work with, um, when we set that policy up, it is set up for the maximum level of success with the number one area where their eyes go. What does that cash value look like? How is it performing? Because it's people's money. That is what they care about. And every time we ask them, it's what, we, what they care about. And the data is pretty forthcoming where those major mutuals have done it. And I don't have it from anyone else, even though we dig, dig, dig. Um, some are getting close, some other, major, some other smaller mutuals, but we don't have it. IUL, we definitely don't have it. And that's that's where I'm at. So I'm personally, I won't sell a policy unless I have the proof first. Um, and I'm not going to put my own money there unless I have the proof that first. So that's a lot of you know back and forth we had there. I'll have that conversation or discuss that with a potential broker or agent. And then you're going to get a sense to say, okay, you know, let me see if I can get the proof because I really want to sell the IUL because I do think it'll work from what my peers have told me. Or, you know what, when I question my peers on that, I try and get the proof. I can't get it. I like having it as an option, but I just want to be transparent with my potential clients, just letting them know, hey, the IUL, I've got a ton of potential here, but I also have some added risk. Just And what I mean when I say that, the expenses always exceed the guarantees. Um, historically, they've under-delivered. Just be transparent. Show everything with both options. What about, I, I never hear, um, I don't know how this works really as, as I'm thinking about this. I never hear people talking about income with IUL policies. Do they have the same kind of direct versus non, non-direct recognition type loans? Because I feel yeah. like that's a, that, that's a huge thing in our world. And I don't hear about it at all when people are talking about IUL. How how it, how does the how does money come out of this policy? How is it treated when it comes out of this policy? How is the remaining cash value treated? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so we do see that quite a bit, um, and the treatment is similar or can be similar with uh, several carriers out there uh, to a non-direct recognition whole life policy. Oh, okay. Meaning, yeah, when I when I borrow against it, I'm going to receive the same indexed crediting rate on any non-borrowed and borrowed money, which conceptually, right, you can really hit a home run with that. <laughs> and, and you can do the same thing um, actually with um, some whole life products offer this. Guardian's one of them um, where they've got that indexed participation rider. So you, you've got a whole life product now with an indexed rider. The thing with them is their direct recognition. So if you borrow against it, how, how they work is they'll credit you a dividend that matches the loan interest rate on borrowed funds, not the indexed, ride, indexed feature. Until year 10, where you can elect the variable rate and then it goes non-direct recognition. So my point for mentioning that is you can mimic, 
I know, right? But you can mimic that whole index strategy where, hey, if I've got a non-direct recognition whole life, which I could technically do with Guardian in year 10, um, now I can index it and I still have a guaranteed rate that exceeds the insurance expenses and I'm receiving the index crediting rate on everything, even if I have funds borrowed out. Um, so you can do that with IUL and with whole life in some respects. So you can there. And then with IULs, a lot of times you'll see lower loan interest rates than, than you will with whole life, at least before the 7702 change. Um, so that's where on an income basis, the models can look quite attractive because you're, you've got a positive spread. On an illustration, almost every time you're going to illustrate a greater earning rate than what the cost to borrow is. So, of course, it'll look very good. But that's where I want to look at reality. I'm illustrating a higher rate than what I'm paying. But in reality, does that happen? Because if it's a wash or if it's less, that's where I'm in trouble and I'm going to have to pivot my strategy. Yeah, I always wonder in scenarios like that, like what happens to a policy like that? You know, when we look at illustrations, we're always looking at, at you know, flat level performance and i always wonder if the policy like that what happens in the year where you're pulling money out of the policy and there was a bad year in the stock market i think it has a, a much more disastrous effect in that one year than people would think it it does and it depends where you're at in the policy and how old you right, are but right the reason you why so many variables. Yeah. So the reason why is with an IUL, you've got a guaranteed rate, usually between zero and, and 1%. Some some companies have fixed rates, two or three percent if you elect that account, but call it zero to one percent, whatever it is. But you have insurance expenses that will exceed that guaranteed rate. Because with an IUL, the expenses go up no matter what. That's why when we look at the guaranteed ledger of an IUL it always implodes, right? It blows up because those expenses exceed the guarantees. Right. So to that point, if you are looking to pull income out from a policy down the road and you have a flat year because the market goes down, so you're indexing, so you're not going to lose money with respect to the S&P 500 going down, but the expenses still go up. So effectively, you've got a negative hit and you're taking income from it. You want to look at it more than anything else, just the numbers, yeah, just how it impacts future growth and such. So, I mean, you just want to measure it year over year with the, the actual performance and enforced illustration in that case, not a hypothetical. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, all right, great. Well, this has been uh, this has been helpful for me, actually. Um, I have a call later on this afternoon where uh, I'm going to employ some of this conversation. Um, if you are interested in talking further, uh, about all the ins and outs between IUL, regular universal life, whole life insurance, and how it applies to, to some of these solutions that Steve and I work on day in and day out. Feel free to reach out to me at any time, Mike Courtney, Mass Mutual Brokerage, or if you want to talk all things cash value, life insurance, and sales process and marketing, Steve Parisi, IBC Global is your man. Steve, how's as we're going, as we're, you know, gearing up and ramping up for 2022, you know, you never took the the foot off the pedal and we're still moving forward and you know, 100 miles an hour, right? We are, yeah. Um, December was a killer month just with the year end, but then I'm I'm always shocked with how things work out. January, it looks like it's gonna be our best month ever. Um, which is, which is good. Like, it's great. Like we'll keep on pressing forward and having fun with it. Cause that's what it's about. Um, but no, it's, it's moving, which is good. Good. I like a hot start to the year. Yeah. Right on. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks everybody. We'll catch up with you soon. Thank you, Mike. Enjoy.